It's May 5th, 2019. This is the Fancy Ramen Podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Neil. And I'm Scott. You're going to listen to me talk about ranting on PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, and Vita things. Other topics that we encounter today are mostly me ranting about The Long Dark once again, a game that has continued to surprise and delight me in positive ways. And Wolf Marathons. Wolf Rivers? Wolf Blizzards. Wolf Blizzards, yes. And then we just... uh, All stop talking? (laughs) Well, yeah, no, my question again is like, we add the intro, so it's uh, just straight into like raw audio. Yeah, just imagine the song is over now. now. It's... It's so wild. Okay. It's kind of weird, right? Um, it, it allows for us to have running starts, but if we don't necessarily, it's like we're intentionally starting to run. I had a running start, but I stopped and I waited. I looked behind me. I said, is someone going to pass the baton? <laughs> uh, forgetting that I could have had the baton in my hands the whole time. Long story short, hammer throwing sounds cool. What am I actually going to do after we record this podcast? I'm going to go axe throwing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some uh, axe throwing at a new local business that has opened up that apparently is, uh, I don't know, it doesn't have any uh, injury reports or death counts yet as far as I know. So so you're looking to change that gold. then? <laughs> yeah, I, sh- I sure am. One of those Look, newfangled I, axe throwing beer drinking places <clears throat> yeah you remember uh call of duty black ops sticks and stones i was really good at uh part of that and that was the uh axe throwing and and the knife shooting and less with the crossbow which i think is the sticks portion but <laughs> i'm going to translate that into real life skill and throw some hatchets at a wall that's probably the other thing too is it says axe throwing but i'm almost certain that these things all would qualify as hatchets if uh i were to get like a concrete definition see now i've got to like figure out hatchet versus axe what what is the difference i'm not entirely sure i'm also trying to think of what game i play oh yeah oh Um, a small one-handed axe versus a um no you'll be throwing actual axes Oh, because it's two-handed? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, okay. So, about, but it, It's uh, one of those things, though, where the hatchet itself doesn't change just because you're using two hands on it, right? Right. And so if Let's people like, uh, can feasibly use the hatchet sword. with one hand, I think that makes it a hatchet. You, you mean, mean the axe with one use hand? An axe with one hand? Yeah. Well, well there right. is such thing as a small axe, which looks a little bit bigger than a hatchet. And hey, then there's the mall axe, which is way bigger than a hatchet. If Shining Force 2 has taught me anything, it's that hatchets have much less attack than even small axes or iron axes. Gotcha. Well, yeah, they're because they're hatchets. Exactly. And if Red Dead has taught me anything, hatchets, tomahawks, and cleavers all do plenty of damage. If Hitman has taught me anything, it's that hatchets are homing missiles. <laughs> if Hitman it's taught me anything, anything that you throw can be a homing missile. I love the briefcase. Yeah. Yeah. If an if uh, Fire Emblem has taught me anything, hatchets can both be a uh, melee and a ranged weapon. If Fire Emblem's taught me anything, hatchets and axes are weak to swords. <laughs> if Fire Emblem's taught me anything, rock, paper, scissors is the best way to have like straight up warfare it in a oh man i fucked it up really right now we're just trying to figure out what the what the rock is to the scissors known as nukes all right once we do that then i think war is going to get a little more interesting in this day and age (laughs) but then we don't don't we have to integrate paper into that or is is paper like cyber warfare like i mean we we can't know what paper is until we figure out what the rock is until we get rock yeah I got nothing. I'm just going to go this way. <laughs> Hi. How's everybody been? I'm good. I'm very good. Well, that's good. So I was telling Neil a little bit earlier, I learned that I got the apnea. Sleep apnea? Yeah. You got to do a sleep study? I already did one. They told you you had the apnea? Yep. They told me I had the apnea, and then they fitted me with a um, CPAP machine. Oh, my gosh. 
it's it's very cool that you get to be this old this soon in your life i know i'm excited from what i hear like your quality of uh sleep raises quite a bit um i don't know yet but i just found out of the three days i've worn it day one was kind of uncomfortable and i had to like fiddle with it at like three o'clock in the morning because of life and then day two it was also uncomfortable but i've adjusted the straps a little bit but at three o'clock in the morning when i usually wake up i just didn't bother with fiddling with it because lizzie complained when i fiddled with it so i just took it off and then day three which was last night i slept fully through the night didn't even wake up once you strike me as someone who didn't have any sleep problems or any noticeable sleep problems prior to finding out that you have apnea. Was it well, just like... I've always snored mm-hmm. after I got past 200 pounds. And then Lizzie has always been like, okay, your snoring is getting progressively worse. A, lose weight. B, go to your doctor and get a sleep study. <laughs> That's what I was wondering if if your snoring or my snoring for that matter would get better if I lost some weight. So like I Probably. ultimately need to get a sleep study done or a take home kit, but I in the meantime have been working on kind of cleaning up my diet, drinking more Huel. This podcast is not uh sponsored by Huel or in any ways Yet. condones the use of Huel uh under a strict dietary regimen. But yeah, so I, snoring. I, I gotta, also think the snoring gets study. worse because of allergies too, because the pollen or whatever is happening right now, like I have some of the worst congestion I've ever had in my life. And it's just like a constant thing now. You should get a CPAP machine. It comes with like a, mine has a built-in humidifier. So I get the humidity right into my face hole. That's kind of cool. Does that help with congestion though? Maybe. Or does that just further make the mucus thicker and more moist? One of the two, man. If it's providing moisture, wouldn't it dilute the uh I don't know. It depends. Certain certain allergy medicines I think are designed to actually dry up your your sinuses so you can get that shit out more easily. I could be wrong. Wait, is that a decongestant or a congestant? Decongestants. Who would take a congestion? You know what, guys? I want to be more (laughs) congested today. (laughs) <laughs> you know i'm a little dry it's gonna I'm be feeling too dry yeah <laughs> there there are two ways to approach problems though uh especially when it comes to messing with people's like biochemistry and oftentimes you can just take one extreme or the other extreme to try and solve the problem it's like you could super dry it out or you could get it very like moist or dilute and technically both ways your body might be able to clear the problem so are, you a, are you thinking a neti pot yeah like a neti pot for instance you over hydrate in a sense with that except it's a saline solution so it's better than just like pouring water through your nose that'd be bad would um, it be bad i mean it wouldn't be as good as pouring a saline solution through your nose <laughs> you, you can you can do water in neti pots but if you're going to do that you want to use either boiled water or uh distilled water distilled. for sure because you don't want any of that brain-eating bacteria going up into your fucking nose next time on the fancy ramen podcast the, to- the podcast about health and dietary <laughs> health and dietary um advice yo guys i've been doing that keto it's for real Look, if you're not trying to keep your podcast audience from experiencing brain parasites, are you really providing a service at all? Yeah, exactly. That's my biggest question. Part of our grant from the government is that we need to have PSAs at least once every 117 episodes. So we're finally following through uh, at the <laughs> deadline episode. <laughs> I also never thought we'd be uh, funded by the, uh, what would it be, by the NHS? Wait, the NHL is funding funding us? <laughs> the no, NHL. NHS. Uh, <laughs> That's why we talk so much about Wait. hockey. Oh, maybe it's not NHS. Ah, oh, shoot. Yeah, no, it is. National Homeland NHS Security. NHS is in England. I'm totally I'm totally wrong. I'm thinking Well, NHS thank goodness we in... all live in England. Nebraska Humane Society? Oh my goodness. Why can't I think of it right? Oh well. Wait, H- why is the NHS finding a cure for tens of thousands of more people? What HSA? Is- no, that's a health savings account. Man, I don't I don't remember all of my medical acronyms from uh medical working school. in a far well, working in a pharmacy or, or uh 
being em- employed in a hospital, but I can't remember now. Maybe it's oh. NHA, National Health Association. Cookie, have you been Maybe. up to anything else? Any. Um, besides getting a CPAP machine, I got a new bass guitar. Oh, is that the, uh, I think you talked about it last week, right? About potentially I getting did. it? Yeah. It's a uh, Dean EABC. So it's the acoustic bass that's got the extra, extra wide body. Her four name string? is Bertha. I guess it's, it's going to be a four mm-hmm. string if it's acoustic. What am I saying? E- yeah. That fifth string. <laughs> you could technically get a five string acoustic bass, but I feel like that's got to be rare. Assuming you're going down to a B string, I'm, I'm not sure if an acoustic body of that size would be able to support those low notes nearly as well. Hey Amen. Have you seen Ibanez the mariachi band one. bassist? Yeah. I mean, aren't those practically just upright basses? I, I'm yeah, struggling but... to envision it at this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm finding multiple uh, acoustic basses, but they're quite expensive besides maybe an Ibanez or a, wait, E-A-B-C. That's the um, five-string cutaway. That's, so that one's A, E, here we go, Ibanez, A, E, B, 105 Oh, so, well, okay, so that mariachi instrument okay. that you sh- uh, just showed me, that's a five-string instrument, but that's actually something different. Um, mm. Ooh, what is it? I wish I remembered exactly what it was, but I've recorded a couple. It's a uh, big Mexican guitar. <laughs> so the the interesting the, thing yeah. about it is that they have like this extremely different tuning and tonality to them. Um, and I think there are two bass strings and then the other three strings, while still thicker, are used more as... Uh, like your offbeat, if you will. And so you do a lot of your alternating between one and four or one and five, but, you know, down down three steps or four steps uh, on the two bass strings. I wish I remembered what it was called. A big Mexican guitar. It is a guitaron or... A potentially a, a Mexican guitar. Yes, a guitaron mexicano. <laughs> I want one. Um. Anyway, yeah, I think has that been my pretty much. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much been my week. Besides the obligatory Game of Thrones spoilers, you do anything this week, Scott? Uh, nothing worth noting, really. How about you, Neil? Um, just work. I think I I got through most of the busy period and actually t- was able to take like a half day on Friday. So maybe we'll have a little more product productivity happening on the on the fancy ramen channel Nick, this in upcoming weeks, we'll say. But we'll see about that. Uh but I've been playing nice. a lot of video games too in the process. Well that makes one of us. Speaking of video games, I've got a rant. Are you guys ready for it? I'm ready. I'm I'm prepared. Are you ready, Neil? Yeah. So this rant is about the lovely, lovely service that is PlayStation Plus, and the change I was really looking forward to that they announced last year, where they said they were going to be no longer supporting PlayStation Plus games for the PS3 and the PlayStation Vita, because you would think, would you th- would you both think that? if they're stopping support for these two other platforms, that there would be more support going towards the platform that's left. You would think that, correct? Maybe. Maybe. It sounds like that's not going to be the case, though. So far, it's not, Bob. So far, it's not. Is it because Um, there are only two games? It is because there are only two games. And both of these games for the month of May, which are... I hear really good. I've played one of them. I enjoy Overcooked, but Overcooked came out a long time ago. And then What Remains of Edith Fitch is also on um, on the PlayStation PlayStation Plus for the month of May. Um, I want to say it comes out to like a total of like thirty nine bucks for all the games Mm -hmm. if you were just to buy them brand new at not a discounted price. 
and it's like okay so that's just one month of the playstation of you know just two games for playstation plus until you think oh wait what was april again the surge and conan exiles coming out to a grand total of 60 dollars. so hey at least there we're getting at least one full price game in the form of two games and then you're like uh i'm pretty sure it's just two-time fluke march call of duty modern warfare remastered a 2007 game that was remastered in 2016 and the witness and just due to and actually the witness was a 2008 game remastered in 2016 what no no you're wrong on that you're absolutely wrong oh wait never mind yeah i was gonna say the witness is an original title yeah um yeah I, I don't know. So yes. are are you possibly maybe blowing this out of proportion? Like maybe May is what you would consider to be a dull month in terms of their offerings. Is your complaint no, gone? I wasn't excited. I wasn't excited in when they did the Call of Duty and the Witness. And I also wasn't excited for the Surge or Conan Exiles. I mean, a lot of people seem to like Conan Exiles though. And obviously the Witness is like a was to many game journalists, like a top 10 game of 2016. Yeah. No, they're like great games. It's just the, what we got used to was like a bulk of games. Even if they're like smaller indie darling games type of thing. Because mm-hmm. if you go back to February, which was the last time that they actually had other games, mm-hmm. the PS Vita and PlayStation 3, the two official games for PlayStation 4 were Hitman, the complete first season, and For Honor. And then there was Dive Kick, which was for PS3, and it was a cross buy with PS Vita. Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriot for PS3. Gun House, which was for PS Vita, but a cross buy for PS4. And Rogue Aces, which was for PS Vita, but a cross buy for PS4 as well. So in that instance, we got four games that you could potentially play on your PS4. And two of said four games I had never even heard of, which is kind of what I go for these like free games for. Cause it's not, cause it's like, yeah, every once in a while I do like to have the big, big title of a game, but I also really want to like explore and find new games, not just the games that I've already purchased because I've got Conan Exiles. I've got, I don't, I had the witness didn't have call of duty cause I wasn't going to pay that pay that amount and i also owned overcooked and you could say well maybe it's because you've purchased part of the games but it's like i just want more can i have more please not less so yeah i'm okay if if what you're saying is that you want just more games in general like at least maybe three or something or four for the ps4 right it, it's yeah because just- you would think and they can throw in some cheaper indie titles for you to try out that would probably cost them less to give you access to, right? I just don't necessarily That's think okay. that the value is a one-to-one ratio in terms of like, because we got four games before, two of which were on consoles that are no longer used, we'll say. Because like, let's face it, those Vita games, did you play either of those? I played Gunhouse. Actually on your Vita? I don't have a Vita. On your PlayStation TV? Oh, no, but you played them on your PS3, though, right? On my PS4. Oh, it's a cross-buy for PS4. Sorry, I didn't hear that part. Yes. Yeah, it's a cross-buy for PS4. So it's like I was still still getting these smaller titles, even if they were just Vita titles cross-buy. I got to at least try them. Gunhouse was um, a nifty little side-scroller. Very, um, very bright and colorful. I just don't necessarily think, though, that like two Vita titles necessarily, like from a financial decision from Sony's perspective, equates to a PlayStation 4 game. You're right. They could be putting those cross buys in, but I think the optics of saying that you are no longer going to support or bring in Vita and PlayStation 3 games means that they kind of have, in a dumb way, prevented themselves from giving any games that are Vita PlayStation 4 cross buys. I guess I could see it that way that they've at this point said, okay, we can't do this. Yeah. Which like begs the question, why would you even 
announce the drop of support in that regard when you have ga- like a lot of games uh, in your in your catalog that offer cross buy ca- uh, compatibility, but like they they essentially have they've more or less promised they can't so they can't give those games out anymore. Yeah, and mainly because of people like me who are like, you know, they should just stop supporting those old consoles so that way they can better support the newer titles. Right. And we can have a bigger collection of newer titles. But what they've done was they stopped supporting the older titles in support of not adding anything to the newer thing, just kind of stopping. I think it's a matter of progress. So maybe in a couple months we'll see something new being added to it i mean and not too long like in another year the playstation 4 is going to be considered you know the old console another two years who knows at this point i'm already kind of surprised that sony came out and revealed as much as they did about a potential playstation 5 yeah but i I feel yeah that's it definitely doesn't feel like you're necessarily getting your values worth i on the other hand haven't added a game from playstation plus despite having it for like three or four months now uh, but what remains of Edith Finch has been a game that's always been on my list of things to keep an eye out for, and mm-hmm. having it for free certainly seems like a good reason to play it now, or at least add it. Yeah, and Overcooked. Honestly, I'm gonna play some of that. Oh yeah, if you haven't played Overcooked, definitely get on that with Sierra. You I, I'd heads. have to buy a controller for Sierra, so I'll probably just play with myself. <laughs> that game's not fun uh, by yourself. That game yeah, is really not fun by yourself. <laughs> does it have any online options? Uh, this version does not. Yes. Oh, yeah, because it's Overcooked 2 that's online. So this version yep. is just um, Dang. I Couch thought I could, only. thought I could play with you guys. But once again, this PS Plus thing has turned out to be an entire scam for me. <laughs> time, to, uh, time to up your scam level and go and get a subscription to Final Fantasy XIV for the PlayStation. Nope, nope. I had a roommate who actually played Final Fantasy XIV for a couple months, and he was like, you know, I I don't know how I feel about spending that money. I was like, that sounds like that's not a good... But what about <laughs> not the a fat good chocobo? If you don't know. What about your mounts? Your so, he, got a, he got a purple chocobo, and I think that's when he was like, you know what, making this chocobo purple was a pain in the ass and really not worth it. I'm so, done with this game. So my issue with Final Fantasy... A Realm Reborn on the PlayStation is the fact that it is now free if you never had it up to like level 20 something. But say you just had it for like a month or two, you don't get it for free up to that level. You have to pay. It doesn't matter if you stop playing and you're only level two. Could you just create a new account? It's locked to your PlayStation account. So you'd have to create a brand new PlayStation account with PlayStation Plus. I think a lot of people would even ask why you're playing it on PlayStation though too. Versus computer? Because you gotta like you gotta like turn on your computer, go to your computer, and your console's just already there. The convenience of the console definitely is a thing. The amount of skills and actions and item assignments you need to have makes it really difficult to play on a PlayStation 4 controller. Why were you it? playing on a PlayStation 4 controller? And it also it's not that bad actually. They actually have a really good um, shortcut system. But why are you playing on a PlayStation 4 controller? It's still kind of cumbersome. Right. Yes, you can plug in a keyboard. But then at that point, if you have a computer, why not just play it on the computer that's going to also have better graphics too? Because you've still got to go over to your computer, which is probably on a smaller screen. And it's and this one is just all text. There's no like live action speaking. And that text is real fucking tiny real fucking tiny which if you have a discord channel open you could talk to your guild mates instead of having to chat to people oh no no i'm talking i'm talking the in story text the oh text yeah that no. tells you go here or no do one, this no one gets that shit despite final fantasy 14 supposedly having a decent single or single player or story campaign no one story. cares about that <laughs> no one exactly. gives a shit about that what do you think the series is like persona <laughs> final fantasy man <laughs> Speaking of Final Fantasy and playing on the um, PC, I'm done with my rant, by the way. Um, I started playing Guild Wars 2. They have a new mount system, and so far, the one mount I have versus the several other mounts I've seen, they have a really interesting mount system. Like Each mount feels slash looks like it feels unique. 
I've heard mm-hmm. from other people that each mount does feel unique on their mounts. So like the one I have is just a Raptor, which he's got a slow startup and he'll do like this little zigzaggy pattern until he starts getting up to full speed. And then after that, he's got a, he'll like jump further. So like if you've got like this big gap you need to cross, he'll make that large gap as opposed to your character not being able to jump that far. I've seen some mounts that actually, instead of jumping like longitudinally, they jump higher in altitude. Uh, Guild Wars 2, for those who haven't played it or know about it, is a MMO that is you buy to play. Otherwise, you just buy the disc and then you've got access to whatever content you've purchased. You can buy the um, expansions, but there's no monthly subscription fee. It's got a really unique system that's somewhere between auto-aiming, like your normal MMOs, and somewhere between auto-aim and skill-based mechanics. Like skill shots, skill-based? Yeah, like skill shot skill-based. So you gotta like Hell yeah. aim and stuff for, for like certain abilities, but there is some auto-aiming there to help you out. Mm-hmm. And... It's a lot of fun, but the newest expansion they've got just like super up the ante there. This is the one game I can say is like that I've played that has a living world that actually feels like a living world. So if you played this game when it first started, towns were in like different spots. And due to the first large expansion, there was a giant war that happened. So, like, the main hub part of the world was actually blown up, and it was turned into, like, a camp, like, three miles south of where it used to be located. Mm -hmm. And then that camp slowly got built up into a new city. You can still go visit the old city of Lion's Arch, and it's just all ruins now. So it's kind of a world that's like, oh, this story event happened here, and that's why the world looks like this. So every time we... Every time we get back on and play it, so every couple of years or so, we'll jump back in. The world will look completely different. And I think that's kind of amazing. Because I know that people say World of Warcraft is a nice living world where things look different. But I think they just mean that in the sense of they never go back to those beginning areas. Because mm. why would you? But Guild Wars 2 also has a level scaling thing, so that way you can go back to the old areas and it's not you're just one-shotting mobs. Hmm. You can still struggle even at max level in a level one area. I see the value in the replayability of that. I I don't agree with the design philosophy behind it. But I guess for an MMO, it's Wait. way different than like putting Eldritch Horrors in Skyrim in all of the starting areas just because you're max leveled. Like They're probably two completely different conversations. Oh, yeah. No, it's not a... Wait, what? <laughs> I'm, so I'm just saying that like scaling difficulty is usually like a big turnoff for me because it kind of beats the immersion within the world. Like let's say in Skyrim, you go through like the first opening areas around White Run, and there's like a bunch of just what do you even giants. fight? Wolves? Gi- yeah, like giants. But, like, spiders, baby. And then you come back Tiny after spiders. your uber sweet, amazing sauce, and you go back to White Run, and now suddenly you have like. Daedric princes and warlords and crazy ass monsters that have replaced the giants and so forth with them and dragons constantly attacking like it it kind of from like a world building standpoint I think it kind of does a disservice to to the world because like oftentimes there's no justification for the increased difficulty and it doesn't make sense that townspeople are still able to travel from one town to another and so forth and like you know NPC interactions with within the world feel less justified as a result but i guess like an mmo the bigger priority is about keeping your player base like uh even yeah even and also i guess segregated in some way that you don't necessarily want level 80 or whatever the level cap is people running through the starting area demolishing things uh when like level one level you know your low level players are doing small quests within the area too no, that makes sense. Isn't the better approach that the spiders that you slayed, like level one through five in Skyrim, have remembered 
your uh, like near genocide of their people. So when you return, they've built up their defenses and like have started and they an fight extra race. hard <laughs> yeah there's there's buff spiders who have been training for the day to avenge their uh <laughs> parents and they've got better weapons and technology because they've uh started to trade with the locals in order to improve their like economic gains and there's a giant spider society just waiting to kick your ass when you return it seems much more reasonable and a lot more organic, if you ask me. You know what, what would be the best <laughs> the best possible thing out there is if an MMO gets released that is seemingly pretty vanilla and in that like you play as humans or whatever, like the normal races, uh, do your normal things. And then there's an, a supposedly unrelated MMO by a different company released in which you play as monsters. Or you play as... Yeah, and, yeah. You play as monsters trying to defend your realms from like NPC adventurers that have extremely wild, advanced AI. And only years down the road from release is it actually unveiled that the two games are connected as one. It'd be brilliant. It would be. You'd need a couple shell companies, and you need to make sure that uh, the design aesthetic was different. So yeah, that yeah. way, like the perspective of the monsters and the perspective of the humans is different, and you could potentially get away with it in some sense the only problem is that uh Twitch like lo location internet <laughs> i mean yeah there's so many pro there's so many problems with it <laughs> but i think the biggest problem is the fact that you can't like obscure obfuscate uh like environment in that case right? well so i i think there are like ways or there are workarounds and like, like you said yeah the perspectives have to be different like the human quote-unquote good side that's gonna be like that would be like a very typical anime sort of appearance type of game. And then the monster side would be fucking gritty and raw. And then what would happen when one community realizes the other one is based, like have the identical maps is you have a fake legal battle go on between the two shell companies. <laughs> That's actually brilliant. <laughs> That would be a great way to cover that up. And then my I, fingers are crossed that some innovator picks this up. And obviously at some point in time the fans like the the players would start to congregate together and realize that like oh my gosh we're actually playing against each other. And at that point Right, and then that's when you build the big human spider alliance event that happens <laughs> in game. You merge the two platforms and boom, you buy out Google like you've you've done it. <laughs> I mean, for, I like this. for that one or like for that one player that has been like killing the same spider camp every day, like when he oh realizes that he's actually just been killing like other players. I mean, obviously not within this context of inflicting harm, but actually ruining their days. He would reflect upon his actions, and that one event alone, out of your sea of thousands and thousands of players, would be worth the effort. Well, you really would wonder in the psychology if that person would double down or if they would like completely have a conversion. You that don't know. is the purpose of I, the experiment, right? So I'm curious about how you keep the monster players coming back at this point. Because you know there's going to be those high-level characters who are just going to be farming the same spot. Do right. you like every time your monster swarm, like you control a swarm of spiders so every time your nest gets located in a different way, it then becomes a survival survival horror game yeah, for the monster so, game? Yeah, so I think the monster game is actually kind of more of like a real-time strategy game. <laughs> <laughs> in which, like, you are commanding like monsters. <laughs> Less of an RPG and more of like a... More of like a, yeah, you, you command like a spawn point. In fact, maybe instead of having a character on the monster side you have a spawn and you can move and relocate your spawn, which is going to be one of the features of the, of the MMO is that like these spawns are dynamic, natural enemy spawns. These yeah. spawns move around and stuff. You know what? The spawns react. Their advanced AI reacts to player interaction. If you know, you have players camp a spot for a long period of time, that spawn will probably move certain spawns that remain low level are there for beginners. And those are the people that play the game and quit, you know, and leave their spawns in one place. Advanced, advanced enemy AI. We'll oh call it God. the division two. <laughs> no, will it play like pillars of eternity too? Isn't that turn-based? That was the, 
So that's, that was the one that's not turn based. That was the one that was like it was like the oh gosh, I forgot what the other game was called. The turn based version of the game, but this one you controlled all six people, but combat was happening in real time as you were controlling your party of five. Was there a lot of pausing in pillars too, though? No. Okay. That sounds so hectic. They yeah. they update they patched in a turn based thing recently. Yeah, I remember talking about that. <laughs> I I never really fully understood the the version or the battle system before though. That's one game I should try and pick up at some point too. But those those games just take so much freaking time. Oh yeah, they're a commitment. They're I mean that old like Baldur's Gate style game is the alternative to like having a D and D group or something. It's just doing it all in a digital sense, right? And it. It's a little bit more concrete of an experience, but they're not meant to be blown through in 20 hours or 25. Speaking of blowing through things in 20 hours or 25 hours, I'm going to, I'm going to bounce a little bit early and by a little bit early, an hour in (laughs) and like 30 minutes in, we've had technical difficulties. (laughs) Do my part of the podcast. Well, guys, what episode are we on? 117. Sweet. This is the Fancy Ramen Podcast. I'm Chris. You're going to listen to me talk about ranting on PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, and Vita things. That was my intro plug. Don't use that. That, No, I'm actually going to use that. (laughs) Have a good one, Chris. Thanks for joining. Scott, uh, what have you been playing? Uh, (laughs) I think you're, you're off headset when we first started talking about what I've done in the little amount of gaming I've gotten done this week. And it's primarily more long, dark exploration on what I'm going to consider as my most successful survival game yet. Except last time we talked about how I finally kind of balanced out just the sheer density of wolves. I don't actually know if that's the case anymore in this game. I've probably progressed forward into like the 30 day survival mark or something near that. Uh, because I tweaked a couple of things, I've been really using my notebook more effectively, which is a cool thing that they added. Um, I don't know if you play this game in... Well, I, I actually can't remember if The Long Dark has console versions as well, but at least for the PC, the one very nice thing about the game is you can essentially write as much notes as you want in uh, like daily journal or log entries if you go to one of your menu screens. And I've been using that a lot more this game than any of the others to really document like where I've been stashing things or things I've been encountering and just been playing this in a more thoughtful approach than I think I've ever played the game before. But uh, it's starting to get to the end of the early game and my apparent... Uh, tweaking of wood wolf spawns has uh, started to lose its efficacy as I go further and further into the game. I'm now encountering wolf swarms again, where there will be like three in an area. And um, even though I have tweaked some things to make them like they don't always attack on site there is like a very small chance that they may run away from me for instance and um i have been able to equip myself with like a bow and a gun it's made traveling super intense again which is tricky because now i have like little strongholds i've set up from spot to spot in the survival and this uh the customizability of this once again is like completely tweak this into a way that I have not had to play when I've played this game before and so once again the survival mode has been a different challenge or like a different approach for me than I've encountered ever before in a game that I've already sunk maybe a hundred hours into which has been interesting and and exciting but I don't know if there's anything too much to note besides the fact that like tweaking some of these sliders and options has some pretty significant outcomes to the balancing of my play the further uh, I survive in the game. Do you think that, like, scaling ultimately becomes a problem in a game that, like, 
your goal is to I guess it really depends on your the experience you want to get because the goal is to just survive, right? Right, but that's super lame cuz there's ways you could there's ways you can technically play the survival mode that I can think of where if I could hoard a bunch of like arrows and bullets and then just make sure that any time I encountered like I had a a dangerous encounter with a wolf that I killed it that I harvested its, um, say, guts and did a little bit of exploring for scrap metal, I could essentially create a uh, fishing line and hooks, hooks out of the scrap metal, fishing line out of the guts, and then use the like wolf meat sparingly. Because if you eat predator meat, you can get intestinal parasites. You like build up a risk meter. And then once you, if, if you uh, have an unlucky roll and that risk percentage is high enough, you end up with intestinal parasites and... I actually don't know how you solve that problem. It may be like a very long recovery period. There are a couple there are a couple instances in which you can take a non like non-lethal damage or injury that you can survive through, but most likely depending on how well set up you are could just spell a death sentence for later if it doesn't kill you outright at the moment, like broken ribs for instance. Cooking the meat doesn't help in that regard and eliminating the parasites? Uh, no, it doesn't. Nope. So, yeah. If you don't cook the meat, you can get food poisoning. Um, but for predator meat, you have uh, additionally cooking the meat does not eliminate intestinal parasites. So eating predator meat is not ideal. So like there's actually incentive to not hunt wolves for food because you can't use them as an effective food source. You could eat probably like predator meat once every couple of days and it could still have a like fair amount of calories maybe 700 800 calories in a kilogram i don't know exactly how much but i think it's less than venison actually carries but then you run the uh intestinal parasites issue and if you get that i mean that's pretty deleterious so uh to finish off the strategy I could stay at this cabin by a lake and go ice fishing like every day. And that means every time I uh, cook up a fish, I can have maybe somewhere from like 300 to 600 calories from one type of fish to another type of fish where it's like 500 to like 900 calories. And I can just replenish that system. That game would be super fucking boring. It would be me like essentially sitting at fishing holes all day and then making a short trek back and forth from my cabin and then staying outside of my cabin as much as possible to avoid cabin fever. Um, and I could probably travel what I think in the game would be like half a kilometer's distance tops every single day. What I've been doing instead is um, for each area in the game... I've been trying to map out as much of it as I can. So exploring, um, in there's only one area I know very well. Otherwise, everywhere else, I'm still getting used to the layout. And so exploring and using charcoal from my fires to fill out my map in game. Uh, every time you sit down to draw, you pass like 15 or 20 minutes a time. And then you do like a very, very rough charcoal sketch and can highlight like items of interest in the area. And so I'm trying to map out every area I go to as the wolves get worse, as the weather conditions get worse. Um, I'm in a relatively safe area. So I'm trying to explore all these more dangerous areas before the weather and the wildlife get even more hazardous to the point where I am just running like to see how long I can survive. There's an achievement for 500 days and I'm 30 in. So it's, it could be a long slog. Like this is a project that could take me a very long time, maybe even a year. I'm not going to focus on the game for that long or at least consecutively I may return to it. But if the other issue is, is if they patch it, some of their patches will delete your saves. So it's it's very it's very tricky, um, but it's making for a really interesting game. I'm essentially exploring places I haven't been to and realizing one of my favorite things about the survival mode in this game versus the story is there are just so many places to explore. And since some updates, they've really reworked um, some of the maps, so they're actually not the same as they were when I first started playing. So I'll go to a familiar area and find out that it's been changed to some degree. Sometimes it's a huge overhaul and it's completely different in its layout. And other times it's a small tweak, 
but that kind of changes my survival strategy. Like a uh, camp lookout or like a forest lookout where um, someone like, uh, what would it be? Your, your forest service ranger would hang out in. Like one of them is destroyed as opposed there. Um, I should explain this better. On one map, there used to be only one forestry overlook at, overhead lookout. Now there are two. The one that you used to be able to go to, if I can remember correctly, has actually um, stayed intact, but there's another one nearby that's actually broken that you can go to that has a bunch of supplies, but there's no actual shelter. While the other one has some shelter, accessing it means you sometimes have to pass through a couple of wolf spawns area, a couple of wolf spawn areas, and a black bear spawn as well. And so, the the risks and the balancing has been changed up a bit, which has made it interesting. And recently, I found a cave system I had no idea of that actually transports you from one location in the game to a different location that I thought you had to take a completely different route to. So, like the routes from spot to spot may have changed or I'm becoming more aware of them. And the interconnectedness of the maps is really cool. One would think if you survive 500 days that winter would be over. I don't think it ever does though. I'm pretty sure it's just until you die. Um, and I would I would say that the other thing that they've done that's kind of cool that's changed up maybe some of the exploitative elements that exist within the long dark is you used to be able to avoid death or damage from like starvation or thirst by just letting your meters um get to a point of like i'm trying to think what uh thirst is i think the uh meter when it's not it when it's not occupied whatsoever you're in a dehydration state and so you can take damage for being below your like cold meters limit or your food's threshold for freezing or starving or complete dehydration or tired tiredness i can't remember exactly what it is it's like exhausted or something and each one of those does damage to your overall overall health i found out recently um, one of the tweaks that they've added is if you keep your stomach full or you at least keep your meter from ever dipping into the danger or the damaging area for 72 hours straight, you get like a well-fed bonus that lets you carry five kilograms more of like weight and you have extra health. Um, so if you were to get into a wolf, a wolf attack or a bear attack or something, it may be just enough to help you survive the encounter. Um, meanwhile, if you're going for my malnutrition strategy that I used to do where you're just like eating cattail stalks every time your meter dips below to add 100 calories and like stop the meter from depleting your health for a little bit, you wouldn't have that bonus. So it's nice that they're also incentivizing um, a more realistic form of gameplay instead of me like hoarding calories and only using them to stop a meter from damaging me. It's advantageous to me now to like try and eat and drink in a normal way to get bonuses. Is there ever a limit to the scaling when it comes to the winter and wolves? I have no idea. There just seems to be more wolves uh, the longer I play. And because, I mean, I've already killed a few. I've probably killed four wolves in this gameplay, which is a fair amount. You can build, you can make a code out of that. Um, but like I, like I said, it's, it's not a great idea to waste like arrows or rifle ammunition on wolves if you can help it. I really want to save that for if I try and take down a moose or a bear because their like pelts are much more valuable and they have much more meat on them as well. Though the bear being a predator, once again, you can't really eat the bear meat effectively. Um, the wolves seem to be ramping up. The temperatures I've actually stayed well ahead of so far in the case where um, if you have a temperature bonus from the clothes that you're wearing that's above zero degrees Celsius you don't take any penalties. You're warm outside, for instance. And unless you get soaked from water or something, as long as your clothes have wind resistance to prevent wind chill to a certain degree and they stay above the ambient temperature, there's really no risk to being outside. And I've been able to stay warm enough with some lucky drops, like an expedition parka that I've been keeping in good shape that I haven't had to deal with the cold yet. But as the game progresses, I have it on a system where it's supposed to get colder and colder and colder and blizzard frequency is supposed to ramp up. 
So it will get to a point where it's like, if I want to travel from one location to another, I might have to brave a blizzard. And the issues with that are one, predators can attack me in a blizzard totally fine. I think they're smaller in number when the weather's really bad, but I'm not certain of it. Two, the visibility is terrible. And three, the longer I have exposure to wind chill or um, like snow, the more likely I am to drop below that like protected temperature rate. Because the temperature also drops during blizzards normally. And so then my cold meter all of a sudden becomes a huge issue. You can't light a fire in the middle of a snowstorm easily either. So it'll make travel really hard and I'll have to really hunker down. And then I fight a cabin fever meter where if I'm in an indoor space for too long, it I don't remember what the exact issue is, but it causes damage to your character in some way. It may even be that your condition, like your health bar essentially depletes because you're going insane from being cooped up. I'm, I'm just finding it curious. Like if, if one were to use the current settings you have and then put, it, it, like, I don't know if you actually could use a console command, but basically make it so you're invulnerable or like a creative mode, if if that makes sense, where like you're not interacting with anything. Like Minecraft right. being... Like you basically yeah. turn on God mode and then you just fly outside of your hut and you just lit the game way there for 500 days. Like if the base temperature gets so low that you literally could no longer survive with the regular rule set on, or if like let's say jump thousands of days ahead if the wolves just keep spawning so plentifully that it basically <laughs> becomes wolf rivers moving around the map like th- those things interest <laughs> yeah, me from like a game mechanic wolves. standpoint i would really love to see that too i don't know like you just have to go into the code and see like have they uh created like lim- limits for the magnitude or number of certain things like have they essentially set a cap where it's like you can't get colder than this or you can't have more wolves in a spawn point than this i'm sure for processing power for sure that they have a limited number of like organisms that can spawn for instance that the ai can manage the other thing is too as i build these bases it's nice to see that the game is actually holding up well enough that if i'm hoarding like all of these disparate items it's keeping track on multiple locations and maps where everything is i've set sticks as like trail markers before and so they won't like those sticks won't move i don't think if i pick them up in my inventory drop them in my inventory and then place them in a certain direction or something so like if i'm going through a cave i can lay two sticks over one another to create an x in game or uh like cross off an area like this is a dead end don't go here i can do my own like trail marking and pathing like that but also in like my cabin i can create a stockpile where i just drop hundreds of sticks in a pile in a corner so i can use them for fuel later and the game's managing to like keep track of all of those items and their condition and their exact placement whenever i leave or like load into a map area that i've been to before it seems like it does actually a lot of heavy lifting on the processing which is cool i kind of wish they would make a multiplayer mode for this I mean, obviously, that completely defeats the narrative purpose of this game. But I kind of I the kind narrative. Of wish they would. In, okay, if we want to talk narrative for one of the worst story games I've ever played, the narrative is that you're not alone, and the NPCs that you play with in in the winter mute like story mode suck. I mean, they're just kind of from all of the interactions I've had, almost entirely stationary, um, and just there for dialogue. But it wouldn't be outside. I mean. It's outside of the scope of probably the uh, developers or the designers that they want to do anything with multiplayer, but it's not outside of the uh, available narrative that there can be more than one person alive in this hellscape. It would be so much fun to play with two players. It would be incredibly fun to play with two players who are competing for resources in some way, like letting the companionship or cooperation devolve to a point where... uh, you guys are now really only able to use res- like the resources will only sustain one individual and so you're fighting for resources independently that would be a fascinating game i'll tell you what we're about to hit an hour at this point so let's give our good old why spiel. haven't you gotten to talk about any games you've wanted to talk about neil it's fine we can do it next week uh if you have comments questions or corrections you can write into podcast at fancyramen.com 
please leave us a like and a review on uh, Apple iTunes. We would love to read off any reviews that we get. And also leave a like and review with your friends. We'd love for more listeners to find out about the Fancy Ramen Podcast. And the best way to do that is through uh, converts like yourself who dutifully listen every single time we post a new episode. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. And wolf marathons. Wolf rivers. Wolf blizzards. Wolf blizzards. Yes. That's exactly what it is. If it were a Metal Gear Solid boss, it would be Blizzard Wolf. (laughs) You have to go through the midst of wolves and shoot the correct wolf to stop the blizzard. The blizzard of wolves from happening. That really does sound like a Metal Gear Solid boss now. And uh, Okay, and so all of the wolves are like gray wolves, except the one wolf that you have to shoot is the white wolf. Is black? Of oh, that, that white too. Wolf. Could, okay. could be either or. All the, all the wolves are black in this game, as far as I know. And then there's black bears in the long dark, but they all look brown from a distance. <laughs> so after you kill the white wolf, or the, the either or, uh, but after you kill the boss wolf, the wolf then... The white wolfer? The wolf then proceeds to like... You know how every time you kill a boss in Metal Gear Solid, it has like some sort of monologue that's kind of touching in some weird way and like Snake like... Does it howl at you in a sad way? Yeah, in this case it whimpers and howls and like Snake seems to like confirm its presence and then it dies. Oh. And and then like the rest of the wolves within the blizzard of wolves uh, howl in uniform uniformity before leaving... Uh, Turning to dust. Oh, only to let Snake to you know then go around the entire battlefield and in like a non climatic way picking up items he didn't pick up during the boss fight. <laughs> it's like <laughs> fucking Metal Gear Solid one hundred and one for you. <laughs>